Hey, so thank you. Uh, I think we're going to kick this off. Let's kick it off. Excellent. My name's Sean Wilson. I am a product marketing manager for Skype for Business. I own deployment and operations. I also formerly was in MSIT and ran for Microsoft IT and ran our internal link deployment for about three and a half years. My colleague here, Dan Strader. Dan Strader, Group Program Manager for Enterprise Cloud and Trust. Uh, historically, I was one of the early cloud architects for our enterprise customers. Yep. Happy to be here today and seeing so many familiar faces. Actually, really cool. So Dan goes way back, actually, in the days previous to when it was Link Online and to a history when it was actually for dedicated customers and yeah. depots. Yeah. So, Today, we're actually going to talk about migrate to the cloud. We're going to set the stage a little bit because the first part of this is really for those of you that are starting to think about the journey. You might have on-prem. You might have a PBX. Uh, you're thinking about Skype for business and moving the cloud. And what does that mean? And how do I do it? The second half of this, though, is where it's actually going to get really interesting. We're going to talk, talk to you a little bit about what it means going to the cloud from a technical element and actually show you some great stuff around some of our newest features that really are helping our enterprise customers in Skype for Business Online to bring us closer to parity. Does that right. sound fair? Absolutely. Excellent. So let's kick this off. So, you know, the first, first thing I want to uh, set the stage is that Skype for Business is that single platform for meetings and voice specifically in the cloud. And if you think of us historically, uh, a lot of us out here, who here in the audience has server? Some form of link, Skype, OCS, server out there. Yeah, there's still a lot of server, right? And you're here because you're like, well, they keep talking about this Skype for Business Online thing. And what does that mean? And a lot of the challenges that we faced were, hey, we, we want to go to the cloud. We want to be able to take advantage of you know, the hyperscale capabilities and some of those entrusted, the intelligent things that like your deep showed yesterday. I want to be able to make sure that you know, it's secure. Right? That's the biggest question about the cloud, right? That it used to be, I'm not going to go, and now it's not about an if, it's more of a when. And so there's, what's up? And a how. Actually, a how, which is really where we're talking today. And one of the pieces to that really is to kind of set the stage of what our four pillars are and why we moved the link brand to Skype, also what that means and what these mean in the cloud. So if you think of us, we're going to talk to you a little bit about, at a high level, we are an end-to-end -end meeting solution in the cloud. From PSTN conferencing to HD video to HD audio, we'll talk about that. We're modern voice, right? What's Cloud PBX? From a high level, what's Cloud PBX? There's a ton of sessions this week that dive into the weeds. So if you're a telephony guy, go see Jamie and a number of other people that are going to go and talk specifically on Cloud PBX and Cloud Connector Edition. And then also, really, what is Skype across devices? We made that change so that it was uniform on every device. Every single person here knows how to use the Skype consumer client. And so did all of our enterprise customers. And one of the biggest changes we made, we identified with that, and we actually saw that when we moved to a similar familiar format across all devices, we saw adoption go through the roof. And actually, uh, our colleagues talked about that this morning a little bit and really talk a little bit about what operator and Microsoft and operator services means. But really, all of this comes into play. How does it fit into your enterprise? So at a high level, we are that entire communication solution, right? It's where teams and individuals can do everything anywhere. We all carry at least one of these. And some of us, upwards of two or three. I know my bag is you know, an electromagnetic field walking through the airport. And so one of the things that we've done is your ability to do meetings should exist on whatever device you're holding. Your ability to make a call or receive a call, either in the enterprise or not, should exist on whatever device you're on. But also one of the biggest things we want to talk about is who here is responsible for their conferencing budget for audio conferencing? Okay. How many of you have, to have more than one person you have to get that bill from? Same number of hands. And the reason is, is because procurement of audio conferencing is challenging. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. And then really, I, this is like my biggest thing, is really the ability to take advantage of innovation quickly. Like when I say quickly, I mean now. Not the next time I get to see you and find time to take a window to update it, but immediately. So when we talk about the meetings, meetings 
exist in a whole different forms of fashions. There's one-on-one. -on -one. Dan and I sit down and we happen to have a conversation. And that might be an online ad hoc meeting where I call them and say, hey, can you tell me what's going on in the security space right now with this update? He and I can do that. We can do that up to, it, and we can do it ad hoc, we can do it scheduled, full HD video and audio. But one of the elements there that we announced last December was PSTN conferencing in the cloud from Microsoft. Now we started on December 1st as a PSTN conferencing provider. However, we are now, 10 months later, have the largest footprint of conferencing providers out there in over 90 countries with over 400 cities for dial-in. When we started, it was 45. Our acceleration to be able to be the largest PSTN conferencing provider is paramount. And one of the things about that, though, is what you'll notice is your users that were using PSTN We'll start using rich clients from mobile and desktop, and now Mac, and because it's a better experience. But we still had this gap. What happens when I want to talk to more than 250 people? I want to do a broadcast. So we tied our system into Azure, and directly from the Skype for Business client, you can host a broadcast to over 10,000 people. When we talk hyperscale, that is unfathomable, that we can elast we have the elasticity to scale up, broadcast your thing, and scale that infrastructure back down so that you don't have to have an idle data center waiting to do your broadcasts. And then we have announced the new uh, next generation of Skype room systems, from Surface Hubs to the ones from Logitech. Come down to the booth and check them out. But really, that's only one piece, which is meetings. The other piece to this, though, is modern voice. Okay? Historically, we all had a handset sitting at our desk. And what we would do is we would pick it up and we would dial someone's extension, right? Who here can tell me that you know more than 10 phone numbers of colleagues off the top of your head? Exactly. We've all moved to a contact-based lifestyle. And it, got, it was given to us between Outlook and mobile phones. And so the ability to do calling from client to client, person to person calling, integrated within PSTN, because it's integrated with your gal and AD, you can now not only call the people that are on the Skype for Business Client, but I can now use the ability to dial people out through Cloud PBX in their good old fashion, you know, technically PSTN, but we know it as just calling them on their phone number, right? So one of the things we did is we're now PSTN calling service from Microsoft. We're a telco. And we just announced preview in Spain and France, but we're already in the US, the UK, and Puerto Rico, and we'll be adding more because that's what we do. But if you can't do that right now, because you're not in one of those, we've given you the ability to take advantage of your existing on-premise contracts and connectivity to your PBX world. And that's where we have cloud connectivity. And that we use, you can either use existing server if you've got server deployed. If you're evergreen, you can use Cloud Connector Edition and tie that into SIP trunks or into your existing PBX. And you've now been able to enable those cloud users for PBX. So let's talk about this rapid innovation. Remember I was telling you that one of the, the features that we were able to do, or we're able to deliver features faster than anybody else out there, is because we are able to build upon the Microsoft Cloud, right? And you've heard Satya talk, you saw, heard Scott Guthrie talk yesterday. So Skype is responsible for 38% of all long distance international calling. Well, okay, 38%, that's a number. How about the fact that we do three billion voice and video calls a day, with a B? That's, that's a very different game. And so we built this infrastructure and our learnings on this and building it on that history of Skype and Link allows us to truly understand how users use the client. If we change how a button looks and feels, we can actually see that impact and we can bring that into the enterprise. One of the things that the consumer world gives us is they're much more fickle. Once a company invests in something, they're invested in it. When a consumer invests in something and they realize that the, the 
things not working for them, they make those shifts. So we have those insights. We're globally available, right? We're not just, hey, we're in the US. We're a great cloud provider, but we're global. We have over 1.4 billion miles, or million miles of fiber throughout the world on the Microsoft network. Millions of miles. I got stuck on the beat, okay? The, the other piece is that we were able to continuously innovate. And because of the cloud, and because our ability to roll out features across that global infrastructure, we're able to bring that innovation faster, faster and more effective, and to give you a little bit less of a headache for having to take outages, right? Think about how you want to roll out a CU, right? You have to plan your window. You have to take care of that. We, you don't have to within the cloud. That's why we're able to bring that innovation, right? So let's talk about starting your journey, okay? How do you start your journey? So the first thing you need to do is realize that whatever your state is, if you're in OCS or you're in Skype for Business Server, you have a path, right? And the key is, is that you move meetings and I am for everyone. And the reason that you move meetings and I am for everyone is because it's globally available and it's, very, it's not difficult at all. Uh, one of the things that's great with PSTN conferencing that's built within the Microsoft service is you can provision it for all your users literally with enabling licensing. That's right. The other piece to this, though, is that a lot of you that were here raised your hands because you had an on-prem ecosystem. So use hybrid. Right? I saw a gentleman right there. He raised his hand. He's got an on-prem. He wants to figure out how to get there. Start with hybrid. And we're going to talk about what hybrid means. Because if you've been talking to Microsoft or you listen to what people talk about in the field outside of Microsoft and in the press, they have different definitions. So we're going to be very specific for you. And then understand and plan for your key dependencies. And one of the things that I'll, we'll talk about is one of the key dependencies that a lot of people have around moving to the cloud is that they need to understand what their user experience is gonna be like wherever they are in the world. Okay? And then utilize not only fast track, bring a partner in if you're deciding to go with voice, bring a partner in, help them get you ready, and they will use the Skype operations framework. And the Skype oper who here in this room knows what Skype operations framework is? Excellent. For the rest of you, I will give you a 30 second definition. It is an end to end methodology that is designed to help partners and customers have a common language and a common framework of activities and tools to help you migrate your services in plan, deliver, and operate phases. So if you think of ITIL or the old MOF, it is the next generation of this for what a cloud service means. And we've got a couple sessions specific to Skype Operations Framework this week. So make sure that you, you go and ch take a look at those. But they, it really gives you that foundational. If you think back when we had our on-premise world, you had partners that built practices around it. And we decided, hey, let's bring the best of the best, validate it within engineering, have partners then go and build their practices around it, and then have customers endorse it, right? So that's how you start your journey. Let's talk a little bit about where you live in your face. Now this is an eye chart, and I apologize for those of you past the third row, because it's very difficult. But I will, will give you the very simple uh, explanation to this. Anything that is on the left, either PBX or OCS 2007 R2, even Link Server 2010, those, you really don't get the benefits that really start to show up until later on. But Office 365 gives you four or three key pillars, I'd say. And that one is, is that really it helps bring, make teams and individuals work better together wherever they are. And that's through HD video and web conferencing, but it's also through the dial-in conferencing that we were talking about. And the business calling, the PSTN calling. But one of the things that I mentioned, I asked who here was responsible for you know, their conferencing audio bills. 
And that comes down to simplifying procurement and management. One of the best parts about this is it's one interface to manage it. More importantly, it's one bill. So I was talking to a large multinational company and their procurement person happened to be in the room. It was, uh, a, a, actually it was an interesting conversation. I didn't know the procurement guy was gonna be in there. And he informed me that he had 38 separate audio conferencing providers that he was responsible for and identifying and reconciling the bills across the company. So if you're a multinational corporation and you live in your Skype for business bubble, there is a very, very real financial burden and, and work burden on those that are responsible for reconciling your different cogs, right? And so with that single integration, and by the way, now it's also singly integrated into the client, right? So we'll talk a little bit more about this, but users click to join. They can dial in through PSTN conferencing. There's no having to fumble, figure out where I'm getting this bill from, who has access, who has rights, flat rate billing. But really, this is the one that I like to talk the most about what Office 365 brings, and it's the innovation. Who here saw Gurdeep's session yesterday, or Kirk Konix Bowers, either one, okay? Pretty good. There was an element in it where they actually did live transcription and translation in a Skype meeting broadcast and then showed it translated live. Can you imagine the amount of spindles that is required to do that type of work or workload? The innovations of being able to... My, my personal favorite, I always have decks that I have to present during a meeting and attachments, and I want people to have them ahead of time, and then people are fumbling to find them. I can now attach them in my, in my Outlook email and email them to my, or, or send out the Skype for meeting broadcast, or meeting, sorry, not broadcast, meeting. And when I go into my meeting, the PowerPoint and any of the files that were attached are now actually as attachments in my Skype for business meeting. This is innovation the cloud brings that if you think about, and I'm assuming most of us in this room have the better part of a decade of working in different forms of integration. Can you imagine the complexity of trying to figure that out across multiple platforms within the enterprise? This is one of the examples where the cloud is shifting every single one of our adding features. This is mm -hmm. one of the examples where just part of our normal monthly cadence needs to show up. So let's take this as very simple, high level, because I think in the next couple slides, we really need to set the stage for why it's important yeah, going forward. We're gonna get deeper. But the big one is, here's your, I can talk to you all day long, right? But the core fun function is, if you don't have Skype for Business or Link, go to Office 365. Start with meetings, plan your voice. Hire the partner to help you out. Number two, if you have on-premises, Link or Skype for Business, and you're not set up with Enterprise Voice, because Enterprise Voice is the probably the most difficult, but but I guess I guess integrated piece to making that migration. You should be starting your migration. Set up your hybrid configuration, migrate your users to online. Right now, we're sitting there. It says use the meeting migration tool. We'll talk a little bit about the evolution of that in a minute. And then also start PBX Pilot. Now, for on-premises with Enterprise Voice, this one's a little bit different. This is one where you're gonna think about what is my current investment? But more importantly, if I have a PBX that I'm connected to, that I'm using as my connectivity, and it's about to go into life, that might be a great opportunity to migrate those users into yeah, the cloud. Yeah, decision around existing infrastructure contracts is a great mm -hmm. time. So, we've mentioned hybrid. Hybrid has been one of those, there's actually another one here that, that gets thrown out, and I'm gonna use it, I'm not gonna document it, but I'll talk about it. Split domain is where you've now connected your hybrid ecosystem, or your on-prem ecosystem, to your Office 365 tenancy, right? And this is the first step in moving your communications to the cloud. 
Now, the reason that this one's key is this is where you have on-premise users that you're moving to the cloud, and this is where you'll have users living in both worlds for a little while. And by the way, the journey to the cloud, we recognize it is not an overnight switch. It is a planful, mindful experience that you take into account features, you take into account the users, but most importantly is the first step is get those two ecosystems connected, right? So you can start to take advantage of some of those different things. Now, cloud connectivity is a different, a different animal here. If you happen to be a customer that is evergreen, you don't have Skype for business, you don't have a link server, or you have OCS, and you want to start taking care of, uh, of, off, of the Office 365 stuff, you might want to consider using our cloud connectivity, which is using the Cloud Connector Edition or your on-premise edition to connect your voice, your cloud users via Cloud PBX to your on-premises PSTN connectivity. Does that make sense? So if I have a, cloud that, a user that's in the cloud, they can use the Cloud PBX functionality, so the call controls, all those pieces, and be able to connect to your on-premises existing PSTN connectivity. I'm gonna ask a question. Who here in the room still has a contract with their PSTN provider or SIP provider? Everybody does. Nobody's gonna be able to overnight this. So this is where the, we understand that the, the, fly, the phrase of a lot of our uh, people in our competitive space are like, oh, hashtag forklift, come on, join us. Forget what you're doing, and ours is, no, it's a journey. We understand that you have contracts, you have existing investments, and that's where cloud connectivity really helps you make that transition. I want to pause for a second. Yeah. One of the things if you're uh, a little bit more familiar with the architecture, or you're having technical conversations, and it really helps those technical conversations, is understanding a few of the hybrid details. So on the slide, we're talking about split domain, cloud connectivity, and exchange. Those really are the three Yeah, no, thank you. Now, I'm going to give you a very quick, oh, if you questions, let's make sure we get to the mic. Oh. It's fine to ask questions, just make sure yeah. they come to the mic. Yeah. 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 So the, the question is actually the coexistence of your on-premises with CCE, and currently that, if you have a link in ecosystem, you cannot have CCE and link currently. That's true, so we're not ready to announce any changes there. That's clearly an area where we can make more progress. Uh, as we've stated, we believe yep. that hybrid is a long-term investment for us. Migrations, we believe, are in the months, sometimes years, time frames. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I want to throw out there, and this is, I'm only going to be here for a split second because I really want us to get into the stuff that really is the important stuff for today. And that is, is that you know, one of the things we talk about is that we're globally available. And so I want to give you a quick snapshot. It, Office 365 obviously is available around the world. So are online meetings and broadcasts. The broadcasts live in the Azure CDN Right? So they, they deliver across the world in as many uh, codecs as they support, which I think is now 12 in codings. Uh, but Cloud PBX, the call 
the call functionality, right, that lives in the cloud is worldwide. Yes. Our ability to provide the PSTN calling is currently US and UK, and will actually is actually previewing for in the for France, France and Spain. Okay. Um, but the other one here is remember that PSTN conferencing is constantly expanding. It wasn't even a month ago we were presenting and we were in 85 countries with 300 dial-in cities and we're now over 90 in 400 dial-in cities and we're continuing to accelerate. And we've talked a little bit about that cloud connectivity. What I, what I wanna actually throw up here for just a moment is, is really to understand when we talk about meetings because one of the key things that we've mentioned is innovation, right? There's a lot, here. There's a lot here. I mean, I could spend an hour on this slide, and I'm not, because there's a meeting session that's going on right now that there's also another couple that will actually talk in details about each of these. But there's the, the key things I want to actually, I mean, see, I even have 85 countries on dial-in conference numbers, and it's now over 90, because we wrote this slide a week ago. But one of the things that's, that's important uh, is that you'll understand that in that far left Office 365, Skype for Business Online, you're gonna see innovation of things like interop with VTC systems, right? Who here is responsible for interop with any VTC system on premises? Oh, excellent. How many of you have VTC engineers on staff? How many of you are the VTC engineer on staff? Yes. This, by the way, this is my background. I was a VTC engineer. I came from a managed service provider, helped Microsoft internally figure out our process. I went and implemented my own on-premise, Polycom, Armamax, DMA, got the whole thing set up. And by the way, they're now bringing it to the cloud. Well, that's amazing because that's the innovation that per user per month, I don't have to go and invest and manage and try to do white glove service to figure out how to, to schedule those pieces. Now, one of the things, though, is that people are like, yeah, but it's Skype for business online, and I'm a global company. I've got people that are all around the world, and you've got me sitting in the North America tenant. At least for things like the conference. Mm -hmm. PSTN that's already built for worldwide optimized traffic to clients to reach yep. the best place for the greatest and greatest experience. But meetings are kind of attached to where the tenant is. So that's a big change that we're announcing at yeah. this conference. And, and that's what the rest of today is really going to talk about and look like. So if you happen to be a multinational company or a multi regional company, that has to deal with the fact that, hey, I required on-prem, so I get a pools distributed across the world so that I had reduced latency and improved performance for my meeting attendees. Well, guess what? We're bringing it to the cloud. And not only are we bringing it to the cloud, we're bringing it to the cloud this year. And by this year, I mean by the end of the year. This right? calendar year. This calendar year. So what are the we, like not even, months. yeah, the only year, yeah. less than three months, right? Less than three months. So one of the biggest challenges we have when we deal with multinational is that you end up, wherever you're homed, is where your meeting's gonna be hosted. And so therefore your meeting is going to be, if you're in Asia Pacific and you're a North American tenant, you're traversing all the way back and forth for your meetings. We will now host users locally in the regional data centers so that they can have regionally hosted meetings and improve their experience with Skype for Business Online. This has been one of the biggest blockers for, for global companies to say, I can't move to the cloud because I can't have my users have an optimal experience because they're having to traverse the globe to join a meeting. So this year, we're adding it. How many tenants do you need? One tenant. Worldwide capacity, all of our data centers available where we have Skype for Business today. Mm -hmm. Those will be places you can assign your organizers to 
have the best meeting experience, often in the same time zone, if not same time zone, same region. Yep. Huge change for us. Yeah. And, th and this actually has some great benefits, right? Because it means there's less reliance on that public internet traffic, right? Because I'm going to go regionally. As well, we have ISP and, and Microsoft peering agreements that get you onto the Skype for Business network, the Skype network, the Microsoft network sooner. But it also, you know, I was talking to a customer on Friday that was going to meet with me, and he said, hey, let's, you know, I've got Skype for Business. Hey, let's do a quick call. And he's been on premises. And had the call, and he was having challenges with his firewall settings for getting video out. And one of the things that the cloud does is it simplifies that architecture, right? Yeah. I know, you and I have been doing this a long time, and when you go from one deployment to another, or you have to change VIPs in the hardware load balancers and you're having to manage that, yeah. it's a very complex ecosystem. And one of the things that the cloud really does is it simplifies that experience, right? So one of the things, though, that I, we wanted to, to address is the exchange piece. Right? Yeah. And this one's kind of a, like out there, it's a conversation to this topic, but really is to show that we are doing the efforts right now, and it's actually in process in preview right now with Cloud PBX voicemail, but we are actually looking to bring an exchange 2016 and 2013 as close to parity as we can so that people that are on premises with their server can still move forward with Skype for Business but understand that the optimal world is going to be to move to Exchange Online. That's right. So today's state is for the broad set of users, the best sort of user experience, we want Exchange to be in the cloud. So that is, that is true at the moment. But we're deepening our investment for customers that are going to have their users stay on on-prem with Exchange, but may want to take advantage of some of the Skype value in the cloud immediately. And for that mm -hmm. reason, trying to find ways to shrink the number of things that depend on Exchange being in the cloud. That way you still have lots of options in terms of which users you select and how you stage your migration projects. So again, if you have the flexibility, definitely plan to have Exchange in the cloud. If you don't have that flexibility, begin looking at the guidance and know that we're going to do work to reduce the number of things that have to make decisions. Yeah. So, We've now gone through and talked to you a lot about like the value prop, why you'd want to do it, some of the information. Who wants to see some of the technical elements of how it actually happens? Yeah, okay, well I got at least five hands, so we're good. Um, we, we're gonna actually transition a lot of this actually to Dan, because I'm marketing, right? You don't want to hear about marketing, guys. That's why I've been talking already. But we're gonna, we're gonna walk through the technical review of not only what migration, but we're also gonna talk about uh, a new service that we're lighting up, which is really key about any of the migration stuff. So, Great. Thank you. clicker's yours. Thanks, Sean. Okay, so we'll quickly get into some of the technical details, some of the new features. We've already announced a couple of them at the Kurdish keynote. You've heard regionally hosted meetings. That's that huge new feature where you have a single tenant with meeting organizers across multiple data centers around the world that we manage. We have a new service called the Meeting Migration Service where if you're moving a user from on-prem to the cloud, or you're moving a user between regions, we're going to move their meeting coordinates and their meeting data along with that move. We're going to take care of that on your behalf. No more users have to run the tool themselves. Wait a second. Didn't we do that before, though? If you're an end user, you, you'd run the tool, right? How many end users run the tool? Uh, less than 20%. Anybody use the mi meeting migration tool? Right? Yeah. It, it, it works great. It's just getting an end user to actually do a task. We're all in IT. We understand how challenging that is. Right? So. Yeah. It, it, if they've already called support, it's kind of game over, right? Yep. Okay. So, you know, deepening our uh, investment in partners and our education in partners and their ability to help our customers.
into that as we're doing this. Within this, right this week is actually the second release, which is our cloud migration release. There are actually the scripts built in for those user migrations for PowerShell already done and validated by customers, partners, and our engineering team. So what's the value to having that happen, especially as we're talking about meeting migrations and we're talking about moving to the cloud, migration to the cloud versus also this regionally hosted meetings? Right. So the, the old way, the really bad place, was you move a user, the user doesn't see a notice to update their meetings with the meeting migration tool, or worse, they see the notice. Excellent. So we've talked about meeting migration service. Why don't we talk to them about why they might want meeting migration service in this next session? Let the mouse to the other one. I think I've outsmarted myself with the pen. Can we touch it? There we go. Thanks, Sean. Okay. So this is the place where.
No worries. And so just for people see, uh, for those that you can see it, office or O365 data center map dot Azure websites dot net for those that can't read it from the back. Okay, so now we'll get some demos and we'll show a little bit about how you can tell where your users are. And uh, we're gonna do a little bit of decoding. This will get a little more technical. We'll touch into the 300 level content. But uh, we won't stay too deep there. I think everyone will be able to follow this. And, and they have a special guest too. That Well, we've got two special guests they actually. So. so definitely stick around towards the end. Yeah. This is going to be good. Okay, so I'll show this with my live client in just a moment. But this is the config information in the Skype client. So anyone who runs the client can see this configuration information if they're cloud hosted. You all can see this, even if you're running Skype in the room right now, you can do a control right click and see the config info. Uh, just taking a look here, we can see things like. Currently, supposed to see the slide right now. We're going to pull up the client config in just a minute. Yes. Okay. This is actually a snapshot of the client config. It gives us the ability to mark it up so you can see it. Mine? Bert, are you there? May I have to unmute? Yes, I am, Sean. Hello. He is. So Bert, the, the voice of God from above, is actually in <laughs> Redmond. Uh, he is uh, going to actually show us what it looks like to move Dan. And we're actually going to show you not only the admin experience, we're also going to show you the end user experience and talk through that a little bit as well. Right. So, so Bert is our... Show, and we'll see how we'll see how difficult that is. So Bert, can you please move me to North America? And by yeah. the way, North America for us, we one M was Europe, zero M is North America. Zero M is North America. So looks like AAD PowerShell, is that right, Bert? That is correct. So I have this open. It's gonna take me a long time, or at least that's what I tell my boss. Uh, well, there's 600 people watching, Jinxo. so. <laughs> oh, happen. well, my boss isn't there, is he? Uh, Wait a second. So you're, 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 this is like one of like a whole bunch of PowerShell commands you're going to need to run, right? This might No, be this is the only, well, this is going to be the only one that I have to do. And then, and then the magic just happens. Okay. Wow. So, uh, yeah, sure. So. I'm, I'm setting the user, which is going to be Dan in this case, uh, on his user principal name, and then setting the preferred data location from right currently it's at, it's set to year for Europe. I'm going to change this to NAM for North America. And so that's an Azure AD attribute, right? Correct. Okay. Correct. And now that's done. Okay. Uh, and then that's lunch, I guess. Oh, so wait, <laughs> so you just told your boss it's gonna take you four hours to do this. So you just got like three hours, 58 minutes back. Yeah, man, it's gonna be a long lunch. Uh, it's a beautiful Excellent. day here in the Northwest. Thanks, Bert. We'll come back to you a little yeah. later. Sounds good. Okay, so Bert kicked off this Azure Active Directory command. And uh, typically what happens now is uh, the cloud begins to sync this change across not just Azure Active Directory, but down into the workload. So we'll 
don't know what that looks like. And uh, I think what we'll see is my client will be signaled of that change in about five minutes, and I'll get logged out. The move will happen. My meetings will get fixed up. We expect 95% uh, of the time, 95th percentile, that that's going to be less than an hour to not just move the user, but move all of the my meetings. Uh, the user will be able to sign in much more quickly than that. But things like the meetings moving across regions may take up to an hour or so. So wait, so 95th percentile, less than an hour. Yeah. I'm not just moving the user in Active Directory. It will move my user in Skype for Business, right? Absolutely. Across now, the regions with the meetings. Yeah. Yeah. One thing I want to actually address here. We are moving the Skype for Business user. Okay, this is about meeting quality. This is not a data residency thing for Exchange or SharePoint. This is solely Skype for Business, right. and the Skype for Business user is hosted in, uh, that can be hosted across, right? And it is important to know that uh, while we are releasing this functionality for Skype today, and while this is an Azure Active Directory attribute that you're changing for the preferred data location, the reason it's called preferred is these workloads are moving at different speeds, right? So we're able to be here today sharing a new optimized experience for conferences that allows users to be hosted in a new region. And what we'll see is in the fullness of time, Office 365 taking advantage of this underlying substrate inside of Azure Active Directory commands to be able to do intelligent things on behalf of where as IT admins So let's uh, go through the abstraction of the architecture. Uh, in this example, we have a user from Kikosa uh, that is physically located in Australia. And the tenant, at least before our new feature that we've added, is hosted out of the US. So perhaps uh, Kikosa is a large database out of the US across Los Angeles headquarters, but has an office. path to reach our Australian data centers, right? So there might be some routing that's involved to update that. We think most customers are probably already prepared, but this is a good test and validate step. You know, this is actually uh, interesting because people that have historically been on-prem yeah. might actually have a single egress for their edge, right. so they don't think about this. This is important to think about is when you are egressing from your Skype for Business client, from your corporate network, you want to be closest to the data center you're at. Absolutely. So you don't want to route everybody back because you've got a massive internet pipe at headquarters. It's easier to route them there right. than to pay regional tariffs, whatever it might be. You want them to be able to go local to data center. Absolutely. And we think there is a small number of customers that especially because you know the last few years of our service has been one tenant, one region, and all your users are there that may have hard-coded this network path through one region. And now that we have the option to be in multiple data centers around the world, uh, we just want to make sure that those customers think about this step and are optimized. And there was a question there. Go ahead and bring it up yeah. to the microphone, and we'll help answer it. Oh, yeah, a couple there. And we'll have lots of time for Q&A at the yeah. end as well. Can you light up the Q and A mic? Yes. 
And I'll, I'll repeat the question. So we've moved the user, what about the unified messaging? So if you saw the exchange uh, deployment, or sorry, exchange dependency slide earlier, of course, uh, exchange is still wherever exchange is. If this customer happens to be a hybrid customer with exchange, exchange may be on premise. If they happen to be an exchange online customer, exchange is in the cloud, and it's still in the same region that it started in before this Skype change. For unified messaging, we're also switching to a Skype-hosted solution where Skype will provide the voicemail, but that voicemail still ultimately results in an email in the user's mailbox stored in Exchange, and that means that uh, that voicemail is still stored wherever Exchange lives. Exchange doesn't move with this command today. That may change in the future, but the voicemail ultimately will be in a mailbox wherever the mailbox is today. So that's the answer for that. OK, so let me address that. Uh, so this is, a, this is a good concern. This question comes up frequently. What about the, what about the delay, jitter, round trip time, all the, you've, you've made meetings better, great. But what about voicemail? Is voicemail going to be worse with this? Well, the answer is, is multi-part. The first is, uh, it can't be worse, because we've only made this thing better, right? It can still be as bad as it may be today. Uh, the second is, as voicemail switches to the Skype for Business fabric, we can actually capture that voicemail closer to where the user is. And then at that point, once it's recorded, once you have somebody that reaches your voicemail, they hear the voicemail greeting and they record the message, it no longer becomes a synchronous real-time conversation. Now it's just a recording, and the recording can have latency because you can use as much buffer as you want, and that can be stored in a mailbox and played back uh, without having to worry about where it lives. Uh, so for the perf part, uh, we think that it's not worse, and we think it gets better, and uh, you'll see that uh, change pretty quickly in the coming year. OK. Let me hit a couple more slides, and then we'll do lots of Q&A at the end as well. So provisioning. Uh, this is just a, a reminder of what we saw. Uh, Bert did a user change to move me from Europe to North America. But when you first set up this feature, there's also a couple things that are important at the tenant level. So this is really the full set of steps. The first is we need to convert the tenant to be multi-region aware. In this calendar year when we ship, what we're going to do is for the premier customers, we'll have them request to be part of this program. So we're making this feature available to at least the premier customers this calendar year. As we go into next calendar year, we'll remove the requirement to have a process where you let us know you want your tenant enabled. But this calendar year as we release, and certainly while we're in preview, you must be part of a whitelisted tenant list. Next, you need to set which data centers are allowed for your users. So this is another Azure Active Directory attribute called allowed data centers. And this is something that is currently at the workload level. So you can indicate for Skype specifically, which data centers am I going to allow users to be in? And this may matter if you have um, some requirements that you want to avoid certain data centers around the world that we have, or you just want to make sure that um, you're using uh, all of the data centers that we have. In either case, uh, you use the allowed data center location field. And this is also what you would use if we add new data centers. So if we go to an another country, like for example, UK and South Korea are in process. Those won't be there at launch this calendar year for Skype for Business, but they'll show up in this list in the next calendar year, and you'll use this command to scope those in as new data centers that can be used. So those were those additional ones that you were that's right. were landing. That's okay. right. Excellent. So that's the tenant part. That's what you do at the tenant level. It's global. You kind of do it one time. Then we get to the user part. This is the part that Bert showed. This part's super, super easy. If your users are already in the cloud, you set the preferred data location, and that's it. If your users are on-premise, 
at the moment, you're running server today on premise, then you would still use DirSync or Azure uh, AD Connect to synchronize those objects to the cloud. At that point, you can still set the preferred data location. Once and you've you done that, do that before, right? preferred data location always comes before the user move. Yeah. Yep. So you'd set that on the cloud user representation even before you run move CS user. And then the final step, if that user is on premise, is you run move CS user. At that point, the magic happens. Our service moves the user to the cloud, moves the meetings to the cloud, and makes sure the user lands in the right data center pair based on the allowed data centers that have been set previously. So that's it from the high level. OK. So we did the user move. We saw the user move. So let's show what that looks like in our infrastructure. Uh, again, using the Australian example, uh, the customer directory is syncing with our cloud. The gray box here is uh, the directory represented by Azure Active Directory. So first, you sync the objects into Azure Active Directory. Inside of our cloud, we have a Skype forest that is hosting the users. Uh, today, before this announcement, that was one forest, one data center pair. So in this example, North America, these objects flow all the way down into our capacity forest where we provide things like servers for the SFB clients. And uh, these are the steps to set up the tenant. So using uh, the Azure AD command, set MSO, company multinational enabled, to true. And then setting allowed data locations. In this example, the Australian customer is adding Australia. So adding the Australian data centers by choosing location AUS. And I'll pause here for a moment so folks can get pictures. You're also seeing the locations that we plan to launch with this calendar year, North America, Europe, APAC, Australia, Japan, India, Canada. And once that's done, Azure Active Directory is already synced to AAD. And now, with the allowed data location flag set on the tenant, Skype for Business in Australia is getting a copy of the Skype for Business directory that it needs. That way, users can exist in Australia. So there's a little bit of syncing here that happens. And there's a little bit of latency here that happens. So this sort of one-time setup on the tenant Expect a day, uh, sort of worst case for this to all flow through. And after that, then user moves can happen. OK. So getting to the users, this is exactly what Bert showed. Uh, we can set a user. We can check a user. Ultimately, what we want to do is not just check and see if that setting is set in Azure Active Directory, but if that setting has been reflected in our Skype for Business environment. So if you're really getting down to the technical troubleshooting or you want to see if you can uh, log in as fast as possible, you can actually check the Skype environment in the cloud for the setting. And if it's not reflected yet, then the move hasn't completely completed. And the visual representation of that, same thing. OK. Oh, holy cow. OK. Write that in there. Great. So now checking the users, we'll flip back to my desktop. You can see that. The cloud is actually, I hope you just saw that. You see the client was signed out for a moment? And it's, no. still, it's still populating your, your, the different pieces, right? right. Your user presence. OK. And user. So let's see. This is a live demo, so. Uh, hey, yes. And a new feature. We'll find out if the move is actually completed. And then if it has, we can have Bert show the tenant admin way of confirming this. OK, great. So we're still in the process of updating. 
and let's check in with Bert. Yep, Bert was just uh, just confirming with me that you don't have a registrar pool yet in zero M, but your okay. other elements have actually started. Great. So we can see that the move is uh, is happening. It's in process, and I think once we get to Q and A, we'll actually be able to show it completed. But uh, we're already seeing the client notice that changes are happening in the cloud. And the client's really good about trying to stay connected, be connected, and uh, continue to function. And so it is. Uh, but there'll be those little moments during the move. And for that reason, we recommend doing this during off hours for the user. Again, you know, give something like an hour window. That's probably reasonable in most cases. You know, a day if you want to be really, really sure for Much large less portions than, of users. Than historical Much less than hard. Right? That's right. So Historical update windows could range in a 12 FE pool exactly. hours. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So this is how Bert will demonstrate uh, from the tenant admin side that the move is complete. There's a couple different ways to validate this, but the best, most accurate way to validate this is, remember, the change happens in Azure AD, but we want to validate it from the Skype admin perspective. So we start Skype for Business admin remote PowerShell. That's that first arrow. And then the second arrow is simply get see us online user. There's a new attribute, preferred data location. And if that preferred data location still says Europe, then the move has not completed. In my example, with the user move we just kicked off, if it says NAM, then the move is actually completed on the Skype side. So that's the best way to validate. And So if we want to show Bert coming back, he, okay. uh, he will show us live the exact, uh, nope, mine, sorry. Can you go ahead, Bert, and show us what? Yeah. Thank you. Give us a moment yep, for so the screen to catch up. Oh, up over there. All right. Great, <laughs> OK, we're ready. Go ahead, Bert. You're ready to go. We're okay, ready for the so magic. Go. Yeah, so the magic is, is now complete. Uh, so I'm going to do a get CS online user for Dan and look at his PDL to make sure that that changed the preferred data location, as well as his registrar pool to make sure it's in the forest that I expect. Great. So here we go. And as you can see, his preferred data location is NAM, hooray, and then his registrar pool is inside, I'm going to decrypt it a little bit, but inside of what we call 0M over here. The Fantastic. Yeah. So the move's completed, and I'm in North America. Let's give a quick hand to Bert for helping us out. Yeah. That was Bert, awesome, we'll Bert. We'll let you get back to actually your day job. So. Oh, wait, this <laughs> is your day job. This is it. This is it. This is all I do. So I'm done for the day. Uh, have a good weekend, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> all right. <laughs> See you later. See you. Excellent. OK. So, and with that, We'd like to bring up a special guest. So we have Tim from Ixia joining us. Tim has been part of our preview program, which has been awesome having real customers help. Let's just do a quick mic check, and if that sounds good. This is mic three for the AV table. Are we on yet? Can anyone hear me? Louder? Yep, there you go. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Tim. For uh, ICSI is a discrete manufacturer of network test equipment and monitoring equipment, and we just launched uh, some visibility equipment that uh, we sell. And <coughs> since 2011, we have been with Microsoft using our Link products. We started in the cloud because at the time the focus was cloud-only for us. No on-prem equipment. We wanted to minimize our footprint. So we started with IM and presence and mm -hmm. meetings internally for us. As we went on and Microsoft offered more, we started launching ourselves very deep into the preview programs. Yeah. And as of late, I can say we have moved our very first user from North America to APAC. Awesome. Thank you, Tim. Prior to coming to the I literally flipped the switch just before I got on the airplane. And I received confirmation that this user is fully functional. Everything has worked much better than before, which is going to help us drive the adoption rates in APAC, which have lessened because of the mm. because of the round trip. This is something we hear from customers. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. 
the analogy that I can guess for you, how easy this is. I saw a lot of hands raised in here earlier for telco. Who has ever ported numbers from a telco to another telco? How hard is it? Parrot. Microsoft's strategy is, let's make it easy for the end user, for those of us who actually use the products. Porting numbers in the portal now is very simple. The same thing with moving users across regional data centers. They've made it very good, so thank you very much, gentlemen. Everybody thank you, good. Tim. Thanks for joining. Thanks a lot. Yep. Okay. Yeah, so we're about to get into q and I do have one quick thing. This is a personal plug. It's a personal thing that I really uh, want to make sure we get out there. We have actually moved, anybody here was part of the Yammer Skype IT Pros network. We, so the small hands. We've actually moved to a new network. It is called, uh, we're doing the Skype for Business community, uh, aka.ms slash SFB community. This is key because this is where you can talk to fellow uh, IT pros. You can also, Thanks a lot. engineering is also spending time in the same forums. We do our broadcast series and things like that here. So uh, make sure you get a chance to join, share, be part of it, get tips and tricks, be part of the forums, keep up to date on our broadcasts. But with that, uh, don't forget to evaluate the person up front said he was going to evaluate if I gave him a tip and trick. And everybody's leaving before I tell them the secret. And that is, if, if you're trying to go from C to B or B to C, do not walk all the way out and around. There is a connector that takes you right to the expo floor. It is a 20 second walk versus the three quarter mile around. So that was my secret that I said I'd wait till the end. If you stuck around, you got to take advantage of. That, was that it. big long backlog. That I guess that's back not bad. Lunch, there you yeah. go. So, Q&A. All right, so uh, form up at the mics, and we also have a, a helper bringing mics around. So if you have a mic, feel free to ask a question. We have one in the back, and then we can start taking mics in the front. Yes, sir. So I'm John from uh, Honeywell. I have a couple of questions, but let me ask a simple one starting. So when you move into preferred location, it's just great. Uh-huh. Yeah. So, what do you say about the customer really, really don't want to get the burden out of that? That's one. Yeah. Second thing is that, so when you do it this way, if the user moves to different locations mm -hmm. or traveling a lot, yeah. how are we doing, the, how are we protecting the legal and the yeah. as well as, I don't know if you guys use these special routing or, I just want to try to figure out how that works. Yeah. And okay. Well. If I move, why yeah. not? The meeting should be hosted in the U.S. If I'm here, if I schedule a meeting, will it create a meeting in the U.S. data center, or will it go back to my data center where I decided my input in? Okay. So uh, a number of questions there. Let me unpack it. Uh, the first is legal, regulatory, compliance. This feature is still admin controlled. So ultimately, your admins make that decision, consulting with any groups internal to IT or legal where those decisions need help. So ultimately, it's an admin decision. In terms of traveling users, like many of you uh, traveled here from other regions, this doesn't solve a short-term traveling user thing. This is still an admin-triggered event. So if I travel to Europe tomorrow, my meeting is still hosted in North America now that I'm hosted in North America, unless Bert moves me to Europe. And that's probably not practical for the number of people that are traveling all the time. So we haven't really solved the short-term traveling user problem. What we've solved is, uh, previously a tenant was one region. Now a tenant can be in many regions at once. And that's a huge transformative change and we're looking at ways to improve the traveling user case. For example, if I'm a traveling PSTN user, that PSTN egress, ingress, uh, let's say I'm a UK uh, citizen, 
I have a UK phone number, hosted in Office 365, I travel to the US, I make a call back home. The cool thing is, is that call still connects into our cloud through whatever uh, edge infrastructure is closest to the user. So if I'm here in Atlanta, my client connects to our US data center infrastructure, enters the Office 365 cloud, routes back over to the UK, and pops out in the UK for the PSTN network. So that part's already pre-optimized. For meetings, it's a little bit more static. It is admin controlled. In the case where that UK traveler is here today, if my admin had set my meetings to be in Europe, they're still hosted in Europe. Yeah. So it's kind of good and bad. If I have a meeting with other folks that are in Europe while I'm here in Atlanta, it's probably good that my meetings are still hosted in Europe because probably most of my attendees are there. But if they're not, that's OK, too. If they're joining from Skype clients, increasingly, we're adding infrastructure where the clients will connect into our cloud from wherever they are. And then we'll backhaul inside of our network, protect that audio, and reduce the distance, if you like, that you're on the internet. So we get you from the internet to our cloud sooner in either case. And on the contrary to that is that if I happen to be, so I travel a, bit, a lot. But typically, when I end up in region, like I'm off to the UK in Prague next week, I'm not joining Redmond meetings because of my time zone difference. Right. I'm typically joining a meeting in that region. Right. And so I will join wherever the organizer's meeting is hosted, right? So if I'm sitting in London and, there, and I'm meeting with the uh, technical sales professionals for EMEA, and they've set the meeting in EMEA, I'm gonna join that local data center from where that meeting's hosted, right? So my meetings will be organized wherever I am home. Just like it would exist in on-prem, we're just extending the capability of the cloud. Dynamic conferencing alignment's not there quite yet. Yep. Oh, Mike, can you? There's not a plan for dynamic meetings that we're ready to announce today. Mm -hmm. Today's big announcement is one tenant, data centers all over the world. Any other questions? Yep. Grab the mics. There's a floating mic. We'll bring it to you in just a moment. Yes. Go ahead. Uh, so, uh, you have a very large vineyard. Yeah, we can hear you. The mic's not on, but we can. We'll reset it for we'll the reset. audience. So, we have a very large uh, China population and users. Uh, we're backhauling all of our traffic, both private and public internet now, mm -hmm. to Equinix, Colo, and Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it, it sounds like you're handling it in the right way. Uh, sometimes, as you know, the specifics matter. But what you can expect is if you are in the, uh, if you set the preferred data location to APAC, uh, and you look at the data center map that we showed earlier, you will see that that's actually Hong Kong and Singapore. So that's a pretty good setup with the way you're architected currently. Okay. Yeah. Got a question about SIP domains. Yes. And you talked about split, being able to split the SIP domains. Uh -huh. you know, On-prem, we couldn't do that because of the certificates, and, the, and those certificates point to a particular uh, link pool or Skype business pool. How are you doing that with the hybrid? How are you splitting the domains because of all that link discovery and everything else comes in right. two different places now. So uh, split domain with on-prem and the cloud uh, still works the same way. If you need to split a SIP domain across on-premise and cloud, it's still configured the same way. The existing guidance is still the same. Inside of our cloud, we've done some additional work and additional magic to have multiple regions uh, without requiring you to make any changes on premise to have that split domain hybrid model work even if you're taking advantage of our regionally hosted meetings. So nothing changes there. Uh, split domain still works the same way. I saw on the slides that uh, there is a requirement for Exchange Online for the mailboxes to be hosted on Exchange Online. Yes. Uh, for for the regionally hosted or for the meeting migration service. Right. Uh, in the future, are you planning to support Exchange Hybrid? 
So for meeting migration service specifically, I'll get into a little bit of the technical details. When you have an on-premise exchange server, we would actually need the cloud to be able to talk to the on-premise exchange server with some on-premise credentials that are managed by the customer. So we think that that is an interesting scenario, clearly has business impact, but we think it's kind of problematic from uh, the standpoint of the current code we have. You'd have to give us credentials that work on premise. They'd have to be administrator credentials to your on-premise deployment for exchange. So we're not ready to do that currently. Uh, if we are able to use um, some alternate strategy in the future and potentially ask you to rev your on-premise exchange code, then maybe. Uh, but we don't think it's in the short-term horizon, and it may be something where, uh, really, to get this value, it's about exchange in the cloud. Well, and, and let's, all right, so from the marketing side, the value you get from being an exchange online when you're in Skype or Business Online, it's not an incremental. It's a, it's a multiplier, right? So especially when you move to Cloud PBX and using the Cloud PBX within Azure, within the, the Cloud PBX voicemail, right, Cloud voicemail, all of the things that you get for innovation in Skype for Business, you get the same things in Exchange Online, and so that's where everything is. However, we're now three minutes over, and they're about to, okay. uh, we need to look at it. Well, then I but should we'll say thank you. Thank you very much, guys. And we'll be up front for questions. Thank you.